Good morning. morning. Welcome to our service of worship this last Sunday of August. Seems like the summer's just flown by. And I'd just like to uh, make special uh, note, uh, I see we have a lot of visitors with us today, so um, if you could just wave your hand and let it be known that you are visiting uh, so we can welcome you. Hello. (laughs) And where uh, do we have people visiting from? Back there. Scotland? Well, welcome. Welcome to Canada and to our church. And anyone else visiting today? From St. Paul's United in Bozager. St. Paul's United in Bozager. Welcome. I'm Colleen Garreau, and I will be leading the service today. And uh, let us join together in our choral gathering. It's Voices United 371, Open My Eyes That I May See. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin and on the screen. In the breathtaking mountaintop experiences, glorious God, you transform us. In the wonderful experiences of everyday life, personal God, you transform us. Through the overcoming of adversity, through quiet endurance, patient God, you transform us. Through a willingness to take a stand, through an unwillingness to let the powerful get their way, eternally good God, you transform us. The life and work of the church. If anyone uh, has anything to announce, I'd invite you to come forward at this time. Um, I will just highlight some of the uh, items that are in the uh, insert. Um, If you do know of a church member who is in hospital, uh, would you please let us know? Um, Those of us who visit the hospital often go 
to have the United Church list run and find out there's no one there because they haven't signed in. So uh, the only way that we uh, can be sure to visit is if uh, we can rely on you folks to let us know. Uh, Compassionate Friends of Southwestern Manitoba, their next meeting is Wednesday the 10th of September at 7.30, and that's here in the basement of the church. Uh, the next chapter, the Widow Support Group, uh, meets this coming Wednesday, September 3rd, and uh, we start at 5 o'clock over in the chapel and followed by the most important part, which is dinner out. Uh, so um, we would certainly welcome uh, those of you who are widowed to please come and give it a try. We, uh, we do have a terrific time and we have some good guest speakers coming in the next few months, so uh, please call Sandra at the church for more information. Uh, I know it was announced last week, but I would just like to remind you about the funeral service for Clarabel Weber, and that is this coming Tuesday, September 2nd at 2.30 here in the church. Oh, I'm sorry, I was misinformed at Brockies. Um, I'm not sure if Murray's still looking for someone with a truck, but please call the office if you do have one. Uh, we were, uh, during Vacation Bible School, we were cleaning out the basement, and there was a pile of stuff that really needs to go elsewhere. So uh, if anybody does have a truck, and uh, could uh, just call the church and see if and when uh, Murray needs a hand. Uh, there's an announcement there for ALF uh, 2014, and that's happening in October at uh, Trinity and Portage. And also the Central United Fall Pork Supper, and that is happening at the end of September, Sunday the 28th. Uh, the sign-up sheets are now out there on the bulletin board, so please do not leave the church today without signing up for something. Um, and there will be tickets available next Sunday, so that's September 7th. Uh, September 7th will also be busy for us as we will be welcoming our new minister, Ken Delisle. And is Ken with us today? <laughs> I thought that might be you. <laughs> so we will be welcoming Ken with us. And also we will be having Sunday school registration. Um, if you uh, do have a child or grandchild you'd like to register today, the forms are out on the table. So that was all that I had in announcements. Does anyone else have anything to share with the congregation at this time? And please pause uh, for a moment of silent reflection as we prepare ourselves for worship. Amen. Please join in the opening prayer printed in your bulletin and on the screen. God, you are the one who has created and is creating. On this day, we come in praise and thanksgiving for all that you offer. New beginnings when we think we are at the end. New life when we think there will be none. New journeys when we think the road is closed new wisdom when we think we knew exactly who and what you are. Hear our prayers and in your love answer. Amen. And the prayer of confession in unison, please. We confess, O oh God, that we have sinned against you, against ourselves and against our neighbors. We have called on your name but we have not done your will for us. We have esteemed ourselves, but we have not respected your image in us. We have sought the company of others, but not always their good. Forgive us, we pray, and make us what you desire us to be. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the assurance of pardon in unison. Here is good news for you. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we confess our sins, God is just and may be trusted to forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. 
so it is that you may be assured that your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our hymn is Voices United 510, We Have This Ministry. Our first reading is our Old Testament lesson, and it comes to us from Exodus in the third chapter, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him. And from within the bush, Moses, Moses, And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now I go. 
I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Our psalm today, Psalm 26, verses 1 to 8, and could we please read responsibly? It is in the bulletin and on the screen. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. And from Romans, in the 12th chapter, reading from 9 to 21. And this chapter is entitled Love. And it's very warm in here. <laughs> feel like I'm doing an outdoor wedding. <laughs> Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in, in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And our final reading is our gospel lesson, Matthew 16, uh, reading verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Today's message is based on the Old Testament reading I shared with you a few moments ago from the book of Exodus where Moses heard God's voice calling to him. And one of the sources I'm using today is found in a reflection by Catherine Matthews Huey. Before I begin, I just wanted to uh, talk about this time of the year in the church. Um, All of us, of course, are called to do particular things within this body, and I would just like you to search yourselves today for that little voice that's calling to you for where you may contribute this coming fall. Uh, We have a big church, we have many needs, and uh, we have so many talented people who are able to fill those positions, and if we each just do a little bit, um, we will have a very, very successful startup to uh, to our church here. Things were not good for the people of God back in Egypt. Moses had escaped after killing one of their taskmasters, but his people were still trapped in slavery, brought low, pressed down, suffering. From down below, they cried out to God, and we read, quote, their cry for help rose up to God, end of quote. Perhaps they wondered if there was anyone there, listening to their cry. But Gerald Jansen writes that a biblical faith tells a story with the conviction that, quote, every cry with the individual throb of suffering it expresses is falling, cry for cry, not on deaf ears, but on the heart of God. If God is hidden, God is hidden within the suffering. End of quote. And so God heard the cry of the people, and God remembered having made certain promises to them. Something had to be done. We know from the earlier story about a baby drawn up from the waters that a plan had, in sense, already been put into place, even before God remembered or took notice of God's people and their suffering. Nonetheless, Walter Brueggemann finds it significant that the slaves, not God, were the ones to provide the initial impetus for the Exodus confrontation. Their cry is characteristic, he says, of Israel's traditional lament. It seems fair to say, then, that the plan that was in place got kicked into motion by a relational, interpersonal move by Israel, crying out from their hearts to a God who they believed must be there, listening, a God who must care, and therefore a God who would respond and do something about their predicament. Meanwhile, back to Moses. He was minding his own business, or perhaps we could say he was minding someone else's business, because that's what his father-in-law's sheep would have been. 
he had gone way, way out beyond the wilderness to the mountain of God. We remember this mountain as Sinai, also called Horeb, probably a sacred place for the Midianites, his remote cousins, with whom he had settled down and gotten married, started up a family, and was making something of a life for himself. Now, he could just do the regular things that ordinary people do, taking care of business. In that situation, tending the flock of sheep. Perhaps Moses thought that he had things in rather good order for a man on the run, a man wanted by the powers that be for murder. Out there in the Sinai Peninsula, past the wilderness, it must have been hot. (laughs) And the air would have felt thick and shimmery. It would have been easy to see mirages and other apparitions, so when Moses suddenly came upon an angel of the Lord and a bush on fire, he may not have trusted his own eyes. Perhaps that's why he drew closer to inspect this astonishing thing more carefully. He was brought up short, however, by nothing less than the voice of God. Here the story somehow pulls together the indescribable inexpressible, awesome presence of God, and the most mundane thing, shoes. Jansen observes that speaking of transcendence is so difficult that all we can do is rely on our words, our limited, inadequate words. God, frightening and unapproachable, warned Moses not only to keep his distance, but also to take off his shoes. Yes, it was holy ground high up on that mountain, far beyond the wilderness, far away from home. But it was also some place where God could talk to Moses in such a way that his life and the life of his people would never be the same. Let's talk for a minute about taking off our shoes. Taking our shoes off on sacred ground is a familiar idea, but so is kicking off our shoes and getting comfortable. In those days, inviting someone to take off their sandals was a sign of hospitality. Jansen says, and Moses finds himself in a presence that is sacred, a presence that invites him to be at home at the same time that it claims his profound respect. Moses, who has felt himself an alien residing in a foreign land, now finds himself a guest of God. But Jansen takes it one step deeper in a way making Moses seem more alert and open and vulnerable to the call of God. Reflecting on the purpose of wearing shoes, he observes, and I quote, footwear protects us from the ground and it renders us insensitive to what our souls might feel, and souls can be taken both ways. Perhaps God wanted to make Moses comfortable enough so that he would actually listen and take the message to heart. It takes only a sentence from God to reassure Moses that this is no mirage, that this is God of his own ancestors, the God who makes promises and the God who keeps promises. Right away, Moses covers his face, afraid to look. God then explains the situation using lots of verbs in describing what God has done so far. Observed, heard, know, come down, deliver, bring, seen, and of course, send. That last verb, send, is the one that makes all the difference in the world to Moses. This could have been a lovely story or a reassuring moment in the faith life of Moses. Surely he would have found it good news that God had heard his people's cry and was going to respond. But no, there's so much more in it for Moses. This is the story of his call from God. And Moses was just the sort of person who would have understood God's motivation because he too knew what it meant to protect and defend others. Moses would have understood God's determination to rescue the Hebrew people, to pry them loose from the grip of Egypt. There are several things that draw our attention in this one piece of the long conversation between God and Moses that begins here and continues through the first five books of the Bible, a conversation that is sometimes surprisingly contentious. Moses may be awestruck, but even here, the first time that God talks to him, Moses talks back. 
His reservations are expressed in questions that could be boiled down to, who am I to do such a great thing as deliver my people? And who are you? Or at least who can I say sent me to do this bold thing? And so naming is important. Jansen argues that Moses needs to know how he, simple sheep herder that he is, will be able to convince an entire nation of people that they should follow him in overthrowing the grip of the mightiest empire on earth? And how is he to persuade them that such a name should inspire them with hope? In the mystery of God's name is freedom and power to deal with every situation and to enable and empower people, beginning with Moses, to do the same. The name that God provides, Jansen writes, identifies God as the ultimate mystery who is free to whoever and whatever God chooses to be, in whatever situation or circumstance. The two who questions come together in God's response to Moses. The simple words, I will be with you. Moses doesn't need to worry about who he is or isn't, or to fret about his inadequacies, the task ahead, or any obstacles in his way. After all, Brent Strawn writes, ultimately, this call really isn't about who Moses is. It is about who is with Moses. Many commentators make the point, a key one, of course, that the all-powerful, too awesome to behold God still works through the small, intimidated humans God loves. We recall all of those verbs describing God's actions until we get to the key word, send, which means Moses will, after all, have to do some of the work. Still, it's God who plays the most important role. It's God who's at the center of the story and the key person. The presence and power of God will make all of Moses' work possible, and Moses will never have to deliver alone again. While the great drama of the Exodus is initiated up on that mountaintop, this is also a very personal story of call. Moses was doing his chores, wandering with the sheep, perhaps fittingly going too far, beyond the wilderness, we're told. Most of us are afraid to even go into the wilderness, let alone beyond it, and encountering God, who gave him a larger purpose for his life that refused everything conventional. It's this larger purpose that changes everything in Moses' life and in our lives as well. We may have experienced this, experienced this already, or perhaps we're still waiting for it to happen, still hoping to hear the call that will transform our life, that will break it open. Our lives today are lived far away from the mountaintop beyond the wilderness, and yet we must feel lost at times, even in the everyday, regular lives we live. Deep down, we hunger for the holiness of God and a larger purpose for our lives, to discover, like Moses, saturated with the reality of God. The questions that Moses asked out loud might have been about who I am and who are you, but inside, we can wonder if he wasn't asking, what could be different about the purpose of my life because of this reality of God? And this what is key to our call. Brent Strawn observes that the story isn't trying to explain why Moses is called. The text does not answer why. It is not really interested in that theoretical question. The text is very interested, however, in the what of the calling. We look around us today in a wilderness of our own and listen and wonder about God's call in our lives. In the stark and haunting beauty of the wilderness, if we draw away and listen for God's voice and seek God's presence, we might find ourselves drawn into a project much larger than we ever could have imagined. Like Moses, at first, we might consider ourselves inadequate. We might waste time debating why we were called instead of getting to the work of the what, of the larger purpose our lives have been given. Perhaps more deliverances would happen if the called were more concerned with the what of, not to mention the fact of their calling instead of debating the why. We might also like to consider the terrible alternative, living a life that is not called, 
We could refuse to listen, refuse to go up on that mountaintop, close ourselves off from the holiness that pursues us and calls our name. Life is certainly simpler that way, and we are certainly free to say no. Our culture tells us that we are independent and self-sufficient. We just have to make it on our own. But Brueggemann thinks we are only fooling ourselves. He says, the life of Moses in this narrative, as the lives of all people who live in this narrative of faith, is not autonomous. There is the one who knows and calls by name, even while we imagine we are unknown and unsummoned." End of quote. In the end, the question then is whether we'll have the courage to listen and respond, trusting that wherever we go, to Egypt, to Pharaoh, to the ends of the earth, we will never be alone. Ted Loder has written a beautiful prayer, The Down Sweep of Your Wing, that expresses our hesitation before the call of God, a forbidding holiness as well as exciting horizons. And I'd just like to share part of that prayer for you. I don't have enough inspiration, wisdom, imagination, will, or faith to do what seems to lay its claim on me or to work the change that seems required. Have mercy on me and cover me with grace. Find a way to me. Bestow some gift I cannot name. And in closing and reflecting on that, one can almost picture Moses coming down from that mountain, soaked in grace, never alone, and never again the same. Amen. The hymn is number 593 in Voices United, United Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. And I'm told from the choir and the organist that it's not a very well-known hymn. And I said, well, then where have I been singing it if I haven't been singing it here? So hopefully the congregation knows it. <laughs> Number 593.
The minute for mission today uh, is entitled, Walls That Divide Are Broken Down. The Reverend Steve Berube served as overseas personnel with the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, and he writes, When I arrived in Bethlehem with the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, my jaw dropped. I had heard about the separation barrier, but never imagined I would be greeted by a 25-foot high wall with armed guards, watchtowers, and a steel gate that resembles something designed to sustain a nuclear bomb. The wall dominates the landscape surrounding Bethlehem. When built in 2005, it cast a huge shadow over the city where Jesus was born. Families lost orchards filled with olive, fig, and almond trees. They also lost fields where their sheep once grazed. The wall cuts off Christians and Muslims from their holy sites in Jerusalem, only five miles away. Palestinians must now apply for permits, which can be turned down for hundreds of reasons. It is easier for many Palestinians to travel to Germany than to Jerusalem. The wall has a major effect on the economy of Bethlehem. Maggi, a local shop owner, talks about how most small businesses did well before its construction. Since then, his business has dropped by 65%. He says most tourists don't come to Bethlehem because they are afraid. Those who do usually take a day trip from Jerusalem and never leave Manger Square. The once thriving holy site now suffers with unemployment of over 60%. Magi and all who hope for peace long for the day when this wall that divides is broken down. Your contributions to MS bring a compassionate presence. Please give and let us pray. Mighty and tender God, our gifts to MS help your church to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Amen. The offering will now be received.
Please join in the offertory prayer. Receive, O Lord, these our offerings, which we give for the service of your church and for the extension of your kingdom. Accept with them the worship of our hearts and lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. In the gathering of your people, God, we find ourselves directing our focus beyond ourselves. We are reminded that you are a God who affirms our being and who pushes us to face new realities. In our common sharing of the faith, we are aware of your spirit that forms and shapes us. In our expectation of your surprising future, we are open to the transforming presence of the one who comforts us in our certainty and comforts us in our despair. We pray today for all who are ill, lonely, and struggling with the loss of a loved one. We ask that you bring hope into their lives and that they know you are always by their side. Today, we also offer a silent prayer for the needs within our own hearts, knowing that God hears our every whisper. And now let us join together in the words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, number 238 in Voices United, How Great Thou Art, number 238.
please join in the commissioning and benediction responsively. We have this ministry that we are called to be a part of, called to go beyond the walls of this place with the story of God's love, called to gather together again to celebrate the times and places we have met God in the week that is before us, called to take time for self so that we can better see God at work in our daily lives and beyond. Amen. Once again, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of your worship service today. And uh, also thanks to uh, Donna for filling in today for Mary. Um, this week coming up, I'm back to my have-to job. I'm back to work at the school. So I won't be around the church quite as much as I have been in the summer, but I certainly do appreciate all of you who helped me uh, through the summer, and I enjoyed uh, the many visits that I did. And Thank you all for uh, helping to let us know who, uh, who needs a visit. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Oh, thank you.